Thank you for your kind introduction. And um, here we are one more time because this morning you had a wonderful lecture about urinary tract infection. But clearly this is a real challenge. This is our everyday challenge to educate, to treat properly our patient with urinary tract infections. And uh, because for those patients who are working as a team, this discussion was already done this morning. We need the nurse, we need the occupational therapist, the physios, also the infectious disease specialist, because we are facing two major challenges. It's not only the control of risk factors, it's also a big issue regarding the fact that most of our patients, after a certain amount of time, have multi-drug germ resistant in their bladder. And it's a big, big, big issue because we have to balance, at the same time, trying to control the risk by managing the risk factors, properly educate our patients, how to do intermittent catheterization, treat properly neurogenic detrusor overactivity, and so on and so and at the same time, trying to reduce the use of antibiotics in those patients and use the good antibiotic if there is a urinary tract infection. And in this case, we have to fight against a lot of persons, a lot of uh, false um, IDs. We have to fight against sometimes the general practitioner because UTI in this population is not exactly the same than the UTI in the, gener in the general population. We have to fight sometime with the caregivers about how to diagnose, how to manage, and how to treat the patient with uni urinary tract infection. The last challenge that I want to focus on as an introduction is the long term because most of us, we are working in acute hospital or rehabilitation or hospitals, but this problem is for the whole life of the patient, and we have to take care of it for the whole life. One example, parasympathicolytic drugs is not always efficient for our patients. It takes time, but after a certain amount of time, the efficacy decreases. This is exactly the same with botulinum toxin treatment. So the bl neurogenic bladder is a typical unstable condition. So we have to manage risk factors, we have to manage multidrug germ, germ resistance, having the appropriate policy for antibiotic treatments, we have to manage the long term, and we have to manage all the guys around the patient to give also the appropriate information. And despite major progress in the treatment of our patients, intermittent catheterization was the first one. Also, new drugs to treat neurogenic detrusor overactivity, it's still a major issue. And when you look at, for example, this publication, which is a very recent one, two years ago, from the SEI database in the US, only expert centers, patient followed at one year. As you can see, that for all patient urinary tract infection is still the first complication at one year. It means that they have more than four urinary tract infections. But my question is, is it real urinary tract infection? And we will discuss that uh, further. Second point, it's not only spinal cord injured patients. And it's a very interesting study uh, because when you look at the emergency department utilization in the US, and when you have all the data for all those patients going to emergency unit who do have neurogenic bladder, you may see here that yes, quadriplegia, paraplegia, they do have urinary tract infection but MS also, we know that, and Parkinson's disease patient. And in fact, the most important group of patients is Parkinson's disease. So probably here we are more 
uh, aware about spinal cord injury, you know, all those algorithms of treatment that we use for all patients. And we know that intermittent catheterization is the gold standard for those patients. But we have to reconsider the fact that in other group of patients, multiple sclerosis, for some of them, for Parkinson's disease or Parkinson-like uh, population of patients, urinary tract infection is also an issue. And the last one, probably one of the most interesting thing, when we have to fight, we have to fight also on trying to convince the neurologist in charge of our patients, and especially the MS patients. And I would like to thank Jalesh Paniker and uh, Bernie Porter for this slide, because probably it's one of the most interesting slides about MS population, unplanned admission for MS patients. You see here that urinary tract infection, top one, from far away for all the other symptoms they may have uh, during the course of the disease. So <clears throat> the challenge is not only for SCI, and it's probably also very, very important for MS patients. Do you know that the first patient treated by intermittent catheterization, self-intermittent catheterization, was a MS patient? It was done by Lapides for Urine, recurrent urinary tract infection. So we are back to history and know probably we have to do more with intermittent catheterization and appropriate treatment in this population of patients. Some interesting insights before going forward a little bit more on educational program is the literature, and I like this study, it's an old one, but it's a long-term follow-up for patients with spinal cord injury. Looking at the risk of urinary tract infections, it's a monocentric study, meaning that the algorithm of treatment was stable all the time. The population of patients also was quite stable in, in, uh, in the regard of the uh, algorithm of treatment they use. And you see here that in dwelling catheters, it's a nightmare for urinary tract infections. Probably the first role is to avoid indwelling catheters in this population of patients. And for all patients who are coming from the orthopedic department to rehabilitation department, the first thing to do is, do we really need of indwelling catheter? It's an everyday problem. We have to reassess, yes or no, we still need the indwelling catheter. Usually, it's no. Second point is the risk factors for urinary tract infection, and there is some here. I would like to comment the invasive procedure. You remember that we have to face to multi-drug jam resistant roughly depending on the definition, the type of germs, the country, the use of antibiotics, the policy, the global policy of antibiotic use in each country is between 30% to 50% of patients after two years. If we have to reduce antibiotic exposure, do we really need antibiotics, for example, for urodynamics in our patients? I'm not sure, and there is more and more literature which state that there is the same level of risk with or without antibiotics for urodynamics. But you know, if you follow your patient by urodynamic one time a year, it saves one episode of antibiotic exposure if you avoid this. And there is also literature about botulinum toxin injections, which state that there is no more risk of having a symptomatic urinary tract infection after a Botox injection without any antibiotics. But uh, it needs to be confirmed by placebo control study, and there is one running in France at this time. When we discuss with the caregivers, the general practitioner, and we discuss about complications on the kidneys, there is a real misunderstanding about the fact 
that intermittent catheters uh, is at higher risk of urinary tract infection more than the indwelling catheters for the risk of pyelonephritis, for example. This is completely false. In fact, indwelling catheters increase the risk of kidney lithiasis, renal failure, and kidney urinary tract infection, pyelonephritis. It means that when we have those discussions, the typical patient that we had this morning, you know, the patient with super urinary tract dilatation, stones, recurrent urinary tract infections, it's always related to the bladder. And indwelling catheters doesn't preserve the patient of severe complications on the upper urinary tract. It was proven by, for, for UTIs as well as for lithiasis as well as for renal failure. So, in my institution, we work very close with the nurse. There is specific nurse clinics, educational program for transanal irrigation, for intermittent catheterization, for the outpatient clinics, as well as for the patient into, into the hospitalization department. And there is another population of person we have to fight with is the hygiene person in charge of the procedure that we use for those patients. Oh, we do intermittent catheterization when it's done by nurses. Does it have to be sterile? Does it have to be clean? Do we still use, for example, alcohol or things like that for every catheterization? This is a big discussion and there is very few evidence in the literature. But you know, we have to be pragmatic. The patient will have 30 years or 40 years of intermittent catheterization. Usually, they don't have the time or the ability to wash their hands before each catheterization. And we have to do exactly the same for the education for the patient during hospitalization and after. Because, in fact, because there is no rationale to do differently. Why we can explain to the patient that during hospitalization we have to do following this type of procedure, usually very rigid, again the fact that at home they have to do as easier as it is possible. Because for the long term, the acceptance, the compliance, the adherence to the treatment is also a challenge. Please do it simple. If it's very simple, the adherence for the patient for the long term will be good. If you put a lot of barriers to do intermittent catheterization, it's a nightmare for the patients. So probably the first thing is to discuss in dwelling catheter removal as good as possible and good practice and intermittent catheterization within the hospital with all the colleagues. And it's a real big issue in my institution because the lady in charge of hygiene at the hospital change every two to three years, we have to redo everything at each time. And we need international policies about intermittent catheterization during hospitalization, which is enough simple and good enough to be used in every department. So in case of feed willing catheters, I will not go deeper in it the closed system, the hydration, treat the general condition, constipation, and so on so. But the most important thing is education. Education, you will see deeper later that there is a lot of things to do about education. How to diagnose, how to treat, what you have to do if you have two or three more episodes, you have to go back, you have to do the micturition diaries, and so on so. You saw this morning that there is still a lot of discussion about the diagnostic. So we have to do, s to do it very uh, simple as well. You know, the definition is symptoms plus urine culture. 
another population of um, physicians we have to fight against, which are the microbiologists. In France, if you have the positive urine culture, meaning plus uh, superior to X for leukocytes, superior to X for germs, on the paper, there is, you have urinary tract infection. So the patient, when you ask for him, did you have any urinary tract infections in the previous year? He said, yes, 12. So you ask, why 12? Because I have a urine culture monthly. So urine culture monthly, positive urine culture means that the microbiologists say urinary tract infection and antibiotic treatment at each time. So this is the first thing, try to do it simple. And I will always explain to the patient in the same way, you don't have a skin infection despite you have a lot of germs on your skins. If you look at your skins, there is a lot of germs. But if there is no symptoms, there is no infections. So what are the symptoms? Maybe we can discuss a little bit more about the cloudy urine. Because in fact, what do you do for cloudy urine? In my clinical practice, but it's not only my clinical practice, it's also the routine for the patient. If it's cloudy, they drink more and they catheterize more. Is it a real urinary tract infection? No. If there is more symptoms, yes. For example, leakage, for example, burning sensation, you have to catheterize more frequently, yes. But, for example, the typical patient who had the Botox injections six months before, you know that the efficacy of Botox slowly decreases with time. And when you ask to the patient who come back for a new Botox injection, did you have any urinary tract infection in the previous six months? He said, yes, two weeks ago. Yes, what, are the what were the symptoms? He said, I had some leakage, also some cloudy urine. Is it leakage because of urinary tract infection or because of the failure of Botox to control properly during the last months the neurogenic detrusor overactivity. So if there is no fever, probably you have to have more parasympathicolytic drugs waiting for the next injection rather than using antibiotics. So symptoms, it's also a debate. There is one which is very important is fever. Because in case of fever, it's not always the, 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 the urine. You may have all the other infections. And usually it's so simple. When you are going to the emergency unit, because you catheterize, because urine culture is always positive, it's always urinary tract infections. And there is evidence in the literature that it's like the coin, it's 50% yes, 50% no. So in case of fever, you have to do a lot of things with the patients. And clearly, there is no relation between symptoms and level of leukocyturia and bacteriuria. Uh, it was already proven in large group of patients that symptoms yes or symptoms no, exactly the same level of leukocyturia and bacteriuria. So symptoms is the key, but symptoms must be interpreted with caution regarding all the other events that the may patient may uh, face. And you see here that there is no diptychs. Uh, in my opinion, and because it's a discussion today, it's not evidence-based, what do we do with dipsticks? It's always positive. And if it's negative, for example, the nitrites, you know that in this population of patients, it's only 50% with E. coli. And yes, E. coli produce nitrites, but not all the other germs. So you may uh, uh, face to a urinary tract infection due to, for example, enterococcus. And in case of enterococcus, there is not always nitrites. And this is the first point. The second one is 
does it save to do urine culture? No, because you still need urine culture, because you need to have all the antibiotics that are efficient for, the, for those patients to readapt antibiotic treatment. So why doing urine dipsticks? And in this case, in terms of education, if you do urine dipsticks, the patient will do urine dipstick at home as well. But it doesn't have all the background to look at urine dipsticks with a more critical way that you can do it. So urine dipsticks, I don't see any interest in clinical practice. Clearly, there is rules regarding urinary tract infections. And those rules are very simple. This is why you are so important in terms of education, just for the patient to understand that all those rules are important one by one. If there is a discussion about urinary tract infection, always do full clinical examination. Fecal infection, skin disorders, pressure ulcers, all those conditions can induce incontinence, increase in specificity, and so on so. So always do full clinical examination. No self-prescription of antibiotics. It's a nightmare. Because in this case, the risk of increasing the multidrug jam resistance is very high. No antibiotics in case of clodiurine. Please simply ask to the patient what they do with clodiurine. Nothing except increasing the fluid. If it still remains, yes, we can discuss, but nothing more. In case of fever, ultrasound or CT scan, because, for example, if there is a ureteral obstruction with fever, depending on the level and the completeness of the lesion, the patient will not suffer from pain. So you have the risk to not making the diagnostic of ureteral obstruction. So in case of fever, you have to do more than urine culture. Always urine culture before antibiotics, but it's always a Sunday problem. And uh, every patient said to me, or to the nurse in charge of education, yes, but it's always a Sunday that I have my urinary tract infections. I said, who cares? You have your urine, you put the urine into the fridge, and when you are coming back the Monday morning at the lab, you say, yes, it's my urine from this morning. Because the only thing that we want is the culture of the germs. We don't care about leukocytes. We want to have the appropriate antibiotic sensibility. That's the only thing we want. So please don't have any antibiotics without urine culture. And it's feasible even in Sunday. And no urine culture to check urine after antibiotic treatments, it's a nightmare because it's a never ending story. You check, two days after there is another jam, so the patient have, yes, I have a urine, urinary tract infection, I have to be retreated, my antibiotics doesn't work. Yes, but who cares? If you don't have any symptoms because of the antibiotic treatment, and if antibiotic prescription was based on urine culture, you don't need anything more. And no urine culture for urine bags, this is very important. Please follow the rules of intermittent catheterization. And, you know, we always have this discussion with our patients. You know, every patient is different. They want to have their own rules. Yes, it doesn't mean that there is no rules. There is rules that we may adapt, but there is rules. No over distension, a good diuresis, and a frequency high enough to avoid the risk of having jam for a long term within the bladder, plus over distension. So it's five times a day, volume less than 500, and the diuresis about 1.5 liter. You have to choose the, the values, but 
try to make it simple, because if the patient is well educated, he knows very well to do the micturition diary. Just to adapt regarding the diuresis, it's Saturday night, I want to have fever, yes, but you have to learn how your body goes with the beer. So if you want to learn, you have to do micturition diaries. Treat constipation, we discussed that this morning. It's a very important topic because you know that with uh, the peristine system, it was proven that you may reduce by 50% the risk of urinary tract infection. Why? It's a very interesting question. You know that there is a microbiota within the gut. Also, there is a microbiota between the bladder. And there is a discussion between the urothelial cells and the microbiota. The microbiota can be anti-inflammatory, can be pro-inflammatory, depending on the type of microbiota you have. So having a good control of constipation and decreasing the risk of urinary tract infection is probably related to those microbiota things, which are very complex, but clearly it's very important. And probably the last point before going to the clinical case is what you have to do in case of recurrent urinary tract infections. Please don't wait until the, uh, the next annual visit. It's too late. We have to do things for you. If you have recurrent urinary tract infections, it means usually that there is a risk factors which reappears. It can be neurogenic detrusor of activity, failure for treatments, severe constipation, or another thing. But we have to recheck to be sure that we are in a good shape regarding the control of the risk. It means having a vo um, voiding diary, urologic and urodynamic evaluation to eliminate all those precipitating factors. It's a short list, you saw the long list this morning, but there is a lot of things that you may adapt for all patients to reduce the risk of urinary tract infections. So let's go for some clinical case. All are real. It's not the clinical case that came from uh, nothing, it's a real clinical case. The first one is a paraplegic T10, ASA, since a long time. And the UL patient, at this time there was no intermittent catheterization, but they were, they were very well educated for reflex micturition. It took time and time and time to induce reflex micturition, usually it takes more, on the, more than one year but it was very well controlled at this time. This is a usual patient and he, he used reflex micturition by endorectal stimulation. Uh, he had some stress incontinence since the beginning during transfer on when the bladder is full. No follow-up for 25 years because he had no problem. He was very well educated, no urinary tract infections, no pressure sores, at this time, the patients were pushed to work hardly, so he, he, he had a lot of social interaction, and in fact, he suffered from nothing. But, because he's getting older, he had more urinary tract infection and an ischiatic pressure sore since the last six months. So, this is the micturition diary. We learned him to do intermittent catheterization just to check the residual volume, and you may see here that the residual volume is quite high. Not always, but sometimes. The second point is that you have a lot of over distension. You see 400, 450 ml by 300 ml by uh, uh, the, uh, the residual volume. It doesn't mean that it's a well-balanced bladder high residuals. Second point is that there is high detrusor contraction, high pressure, and despite that, high residual urine. 
So, and also kidney complication with upper urinary tract dilatation. And you may see here that the bladder wall, it's crazy, the bladder wall that you may see for those patients with 25 years of reflex micturition. So we discussed about solution, and you know that in this population of patients, it's always a discussion, because they had their own rules, and it was good for 25 years. So you have to discuss. The first point, I think, which is very important for all of us regarding intermittent catheterization, that intermittent catheterization, you can try, and you can go back if you want. It's not for always. If there is a better solution in the next two or three years, you can move to the other solution, but you can try. And if you use intermittent catheterization with all the benefits, meaning no incontinence, no condom catheters, very few urinary tract infection, you will see. Our job is to help you to have the, the whole benefit. But you can try it. Please try it. And it's always a very interesting discussion. So we use intermittent catheterization plus parasympathicolytic drugs, always at the same time. Just to be sure and explain that intermittent catheterization is only for micturition, but for continence and to reduce the risk of urinary tract infection and kidney complication, you have to reduce the pressure as well. Case number two. But the first one, it's the usual patient that you never saw for 25 years. And it's a big, big, big discussion with those patients. But usually, when they use intermittent catheterization for several months, it takes months, with the appropriate benefit because the drug that you use is efficient to control the pressure, he said, I had to use it before. But that's a very interesting discussion. Case number two, Mr. Pierre B. Uh, paraplegic T12 ASA since uh, the 60s, abdominal straining and crede maneuver since this time, but since nine months, severe urinary tract infections. And also, when you do the clinical examination, there is something more. There is a loss, a sensation of pain in the left upper limb and thermal an analgesia from C2 to T8, because he had a very large syringomyela which appears with time. Why there is a large syringomyela? You know that there is a risk of syringomyela due to the spinal cord injury. But here there is something more. And what is something more? Is Valsalva maneuvers. Valsalva maneuvers increase the risk of syringomyela because he increased the pressure within the liquid and around the uh, uh, spinal cord. So what we did, we discussed with him about intermittent catheterization, and we discussed also with the neurosurgeon, please wait for the syringomyelia until we have six months of intermittent catheterization instead of Valsalva maneuvers and we saw that the syringomyelia was completely stable after that, so we didn't perform any surgery with a neurosurgeon. So when we discuss about alternatives for those patients, yes, it's sure that abdominal straining, when it's okay for voiding, it's a good solution. But you know that there is a high risk of prolapse, but it's not only prolapse, it's also the risk of having or an exacerbation of syringomyelia. Incomplete lesion, which I, when I do lectures in French, I say, le patient faussement normal, the false normal patient. He, it's uh, Miss C, he ha she had the Bronsequard C7 syndrome and she used micturition and self-catheterization plus anticholinergics, 12 micturition per day, two catheterization per day. So the double punishment. 
incontinence and catheterization and high frequency. Why? Because he wants to stay normal and have a, having uh, the ability to do, as she said, normal micturition. In fact, it's not normal micturition. There is more and more urinary tract infections every six months. In this case, we use directly Botox. Directly Botox, why? To have the larger improvement in symptoms at the same time than uh, increasing the number of catheterization. And we said that like for intermittent catheterization, Botox, it's a drug. It stays in your body for six to nine months. But after that, you can come back to the previous solution. But try it. And six months is, is uh, long enough for the patient to see uh, an improvement. The last one, Mr. A, paraplegic T5, ISA, since five years, intermittent catheterization since the injury, well controlled by Botox and solifenacin, no leakage, but recurrent urinary tract infection for two years with fatigue, cloudy urine, increased plasticity, and decrease in bladder capacity. Normal evaluation, micturition diary, neurodynamics, ultrasound, cystoscopy, but very severe constipation. So we did the, all the urologic evaluation and we moved to constipation and uh, we use peristine for this patient with quite good results, but not enough still to urinary tract infection. This is a very active guy. He doesn't want to be in uh, unstable condition because he had to go to work, he loved his job, so we consider alternatives, and there is alternatives, weekly oral cyclic antibiotics, intravesical gentamicin, that is mostly used in the US, hyaluronic acid, which was already tested uh, to treat recurrent urinary tract infections. Though there is even, if there is all the risk factors well controlled, there is still solution to reduce the risk of urinary tract infections. So you see here that it's a very complex problem and there is a lot of issue that we have to discuss. So in France, uh, in France, uh, Canada and uh, Belgium and Switzerland, we do have um, a French speaking group of neurourology and uh, we worked with an infectious disease specialist, and we did that, which is a support for the discussion with your patients about urinary tract infections. Urinary tract infections, this type of paper, we give at every visit to the patient, we send it to the GP, and we try to explain to all the caregivers and the family what you have to do and not to do about urinary tract infections. So you may see here that it's all the things that we already discussed. So you have those uh, papers at the entrance of the, the room, if you want to use it or to translate it into your language. So it's first part, generalities, what is, urinary tract infection, and what is not. The fact that 50% of the germs are multi-resistant to antibiotics, what to do and not to do. No urinary cont uh, culture control, no decreased catheterization frequency, no minute antibiotic treatment, don't use quinolones, please, because it increases strongly the risk of multi-drug germ resistance, and some tips and tricks about uh, antibiotics um, regarding, for example, Enterococcus or Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which always need a double antibiotherapy. And on the other side, if you have recurrent urinary tract infections, what to do at least? Micturition diary, ultrasound, urodynamics, and cystoscopy. 
don't use antibiotics every day, always the same antibiotics, even if it's with low dose, because it increases the resistance of the germs. And there is solution, increased frequency, diuresis, prevention of overdistension, treating detrusor overactivity, treat constipation, respect good practice. Antibiotics can be discussed by specialists, and if you need to be treated, even if there is no risk factors, please go back to the specialist to discuss the alternatives to be treated as a preventive treatment. So I think that's all. We still need to have two minutes if you have some questions, but the paper is at uh, the main entrance if you want to use it in your clinical practice or into the educational program. As a summary, I would like to say that if there is no education on urinary tract infections, it will be the failure of intermittent catheterization. Because if the patient do urine culture every month, don't use the appropriate antibiotics, not well treated for neurogenic detrusor overactivity, it's a high risk of failure, not to empty the bladder, but to have the full benefit of this treatment, which associates always the control of neurogenic detrusor overactivity and intermittent catheterization. So thank you for the opportunity to share with you our clinical experience.